Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this evening's program, The Assault on Truth and What to Do About It. My name is Marie Griffith, and I'm the director of the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics, the sponsor of tonight's event. And before we go further, I just want to thank our terrific center staff for all the work they've put into this event. Deborah Kennard, our assistant director, Sherry Pena, our administrative coordinator, and Molly Harris, our administrative assistant who manages the macro and micro logistics of our public events. And we're also very honored tonight to have Senator John C. Danforth with us in person. This is really the first time we've been able to have him in person since the pandemic. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. So it's, it's really great. And I know he'll be eager to greet many of you uh, after tonight's conversation. Uh, let me just remind you to silence your phones and your buzzing devices uh, before we get started. This event is the latest in the center's decade plus long deep engagement with contemporary problems relating to religion and politics in American society and culture as well as our ongoing attempt to offer insights about ways that ordinary people can address these problems and contribute to their broader solutions. It is no secret that we are living in a time of extreme political polarization and social mistrust. Our events at the Danforth Center on Religion and Politics have addressed this reality from many angles in the past in hopes of shedding new light on ways we might all make our way through this moment and promote a more just and peaceful society. We want to understand how we got to the particular place where we stand today. And we also want to encourage practical action for responding to current conditions and improving our social institutions, our political norms, and our relationships with other people in this country, both those with whom we tend to agree on big moral issues, and just as importantly, those with whom we disagree. Tonight, we are extremely fortunate to have three political experts with us who have thought deeply about these issues, and in particular, the many assaults on truth in our society that have brought us to this place. Cherie Harder serves as president of the Trinity Forum, where she leads the initiatives and operations of that organization. During her tenure, the Trinity Forum has significantly expanded both programming and organization reach, grown their donor base and mailing list tenfold, launched new lecture series that have been featured on C-SPAN and public television, launched many social media efforts, developed a new membership model, developed new curricula, and much, much more. She's done a tremendous uh, amount of work in the 14 years, I think you said you've been there. Uh, prior to joining the Trinity Forum in 2008, Ms. Harder served in the White House in the George W. Bush administration as special assistant to the president and director of policy and projects for First Lady Laura Bush. Earlier in her career, she served as policy advisor to Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist advising the leader on domestic social issues and serving as liaison and outreach director to outside groups. And also senior counselor to the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, where she helped the chairman design and launch the We the People initiative to enhance the teaching, study and understanding of American history. She holds an honors BA in government from Harvard University and a postgraduate diploma in literature from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia, where she was a Rotary Scholar. She is also a senior fellow at CARDIS, an editorial board member of Comment Magazine, and has served on many boards, Faith and Law, Gordon College, the C.S. Lewis Institute, and the Convergence Center for Policy Resolution. So we are so honored to have you uh, with us tonight, Cherie. 
Our second participant it is Jonathan Rausch. He is Senior Fellow in the Governance Studies Program at the Brookings Institution and is the author of eight books and many articles on public policy, culture, and government. He's a contributing writer to The Atlantic and the recipient of the 2005 National Magazine Award, the magazine industry's equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize. His many Brookings publications include the 2021 book, The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth, as well as the 2015 ebook, Political Realism, How Hacks, Machines, Big Monies, and Backroom Deals Can Strengthen American Democracy. Other books include The Happiness Curve, Why Life Gets Better After 50, I'm glad to know, and Gay Marriage, Why It Is So Good for Gays, Good for Straights, and Good for America, published in 2004. He's also authored research on political parties, marijuana legislation, LGBT rights and religious liberty, and much, much more. And I just wanna mention to you all that copies of the latest book, The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth, will be on sale at our reception after this event, and he will uh, gladly sign your purchased copy uh, for you. Our third conversant is Peter Weiner, uh, here on our stage at the Danforth Center for the second time. He is currently a senior uh, fellow at the Trinity Forum, which he joined after serving as a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He has written widely on political, cultural, religious, and national security issues for numerous publications, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, The Atlantic, where he's a contributing editor, uh, and many, many more. In 2015, he was named a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times where he writes a monthly column that is always worth reading. He's also appeared frequently as a commentator on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, CBS, and C-SPAN uh, television. Relevant for us here uh, in particular, uh, Mr. Weiner has deep political experience. He served in the Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush presidential administrations prior to becoming deputy director of speech writing for President George W. Bush. So he's worked in three Republican uh, administrations. In 2002, he was asked to head the Office of Strategic Initiatives, where he generated policy ideas, reached out to public intellectuals, published op-eds and essays, and provided counsel on a range of domestic and international uh, issues. He has spoken and written widely on Christianity and culture, and also the current state of the Republican Party. Uh, under President Trump, and I know we will hear more uh, from him. He is the author of several books, most recently, The Death of Politics, How to Heal Our Frayed Republic After Trump. This book too will be on sale uh, at our reception following this event, uh, and Pete will be delighted to sign your copy um, as well. Our three guests had a wonderful lunch with our undergraduate students earlier today and dinner with Senator Danforth. And I'm just so thankful to each of you for being with us today. So please join me in welcoming Cherie Harder, Jonathan Rausch, and Peter Weiner to the stage. Greetings to you all. Again, it's just great to have you here. And I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know you uh, better. Pete, I'd met you before, but my yeah. first time with Jonathan and Cherie, and it's really been uh, a real delight. Um, I think we want to start out here by just talking about the assault on truth in sort of a general way. How we got here, what do we mean uh, when we talk about the assault on truth? I'd like to start with you, Jonathan, if that's okay. And then um, maybe Pete to make some comments and Cherie, just to get us uh, started. Well, gladly. First, of course, thank you so much. I'm so so flattered to be here and chosen for this column. And thank you all for, for coming out um, and being with us tonight. I so look forward to hearing to what all of you have to say. So uh, how we got here, let's, let me just say a word about where here is. Uh, you've probably, raise your hand if you've heard the term epistemic crisis. Quite a few of you. That's probably almost half the audience. Yeah, uh, this was a term that was unknown in say 2016 or 2017. Now, former President Obama has among others used it, said 
we're entering an epistemic crisis in which people no longer operate in the same reality, which makes it very hard to govern. What are we talking about in specific terms? Well, I'll give you two indicative kinds of numbers, uh, both of them without precedent in the United States. The first type of number is that about two thirds of Americans, according to a lot of different polls, upwards of 60% of Americans say that they are reluctant or afraid to state their true beliefs about politics for fear of the social or um, professional consequences. A third of Americans say that they are worried about losing their job or professional opportunities if they state their true beliefs about politics. And by the way, that's not just conservatives. That number, a third, worried about losing jobs, is the same across ideologies uh, from left to right. Those numbers that I just cited are, as best we can tell, hard to compare, but as best we can tell, three to four times the level of self-censorship and chilling as in 1954 during the McCarthy era. Uh, that's, that's a lot of chilling. And over 40% of Americans, young Americans, say that an executive who donated business executive who donates to Donald Trump should be fired as a result. This is an atmosphere of widespread chilling. Uh, same among students, by the way, two thirds of students on our campuses say they're afraid to say their true beliefs about politics. And campuses are where dialogue is supposed to be most open, right? So these are unprecedented amounts of chilling in America that make it hard for people to speak their mind, to feel heard, to be heard, to know what other people are really thinking. Second kind of number, and this one you all know, about two thirds, depends on the poll, 60%, 70% of Republicans believe falsely that the 2020 election was stolen. In other words, they believe that America is no longer a democracy and that number has stayed quite level over the last two years, despite the fact that no evidence has emerged that anything like the theft of the 2020 election ever happened. Um, that number, as well as I think it's 40% or so of independents who say they're not sure who actually won the 2020 election. That number is incompatible with the democracy, with people believing that election results are actually true. So on the one hand, you have chilling, people afraid to speak. And on the other hand, you have people living in a different political reality and an unreal political reality. Both of these make it very difficult to govern a democracy. These kinds of splintered realities and widespread chilling are the here where we are. How did we get here? Well, that's a longer story and it's a bunch of things. It's extreme polarization and partisan animosity is a big piece of it. The emergence of social media is a piece of it. I think kind of a small piece of it. Others think Jonathan Haidt says it's a big piece. The emergence of a conservative media model, which is not truth-based in many instances is another chunk of it. The biggest piece, this, this may sound partisan. I, I apologize if it does. I'm uh, center right. I voted for many Republicans, admired many Republicans. But the MAGA movement has imported wholesale Russian style mass disinformation to American politics. The first time that's happened ever, or at least since the 1850s, which as you recall, did not end well. That is something American democracy is not prepared to cope with, nor is it prepared to cope with widespread chilling campaigns in which Anyone who gets out of line can lose their job or their reputation overnight, whether in social media or in their professional world or in their academic community. These things combine to create an environment for truth and truth telling um, that is often troubled and sometimes menacing. Uh, thank you, uh, Murray, for uh, hosting this. Uh, it's great to be with Cherie and John, who are uh, friends and people I respect a lot. Um, thank you, Senator Danforth, both for this great center uh, that, that you helped create, uh, but also for being a model of integrity in public life. Uh, you always need that, but you, we need it more now than, uh, than ever, and those, those things matter. Um, also, my daughter Christine is here. Uh, she actually traveled to St. Louis with me, so it's great to have her here. Uh, I'm a pretty good writer, but she's the best writer in the family, um, so it's, it's, it's great to be with you. I mean, I agree with, with what uh, John said, I'd say that there are a confluence of factors that have happened to, to lead to this assault on truth. And maybe the first thing I would say is it's important to bear in mind that, that human nature hasn't changed. I mean, that what we're seeing is more acute than it's happened in the past, but there is a human tendency to be susceptible uh, to this. 
And the founders knew it, um, Lincoln knew it, um, a lot of people, political philosophers have, have, uh, have known it. Um, and I actually think that what's happened to us over the last half dozen years of the show is a validation of the wisdom of the founders to create a political system that is probably as well prepared as any to withstand the, the assault on truth, um, or at least to hold up uh, to it. But in the end, um, a country uh, doesn't succeed because of its constitution. It succeeds because of the people it creates and the character of the citizenry um, to, to be able to uphold the principles of, of, of the constitution. So why now? What's, what's different? John touched on, on some of them. I'd say one important thing is just as a starting point is I don't think you can separate the assault on truth from the collapse of trust in institutions. Um, because if, if you talk to people who are truth deniers, let's just say objectively they are that, if you talk to them and insisted, look, you, the importance of truth, they wouldn't dispute you. They would simply say, we agree with you, but we have different sources of information. So we've seen across the board a loss of authority and trust in, in institutions, which means it's a sort of a grab bag. And so people now are able to go to sources that they want. You may believe uh, the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health on matters having to do with COVID. Somebody else may believe a conspiracy website and you just get into this, into this battle. Second is social media. Um, and uh, John had mentioned Donovan Hyatt, who's at uh, New York University and is a social psychologist. John puts a huge amount of, of, of the responsibility on social media um, in terms of both how it's reshaped our brains, um, but also the sort of Niagara Falls of misinformation and disinformation that we have access to now that we really didn't have before. Uh, you, you could have a lot of people who were conspiracy minded, but they didn't have the easy access to going to conspiracy sites, uh, places that have false information. And they also couldn't congregate together and form, uh, form groups and, and, uh, and institutions. So I think that's big deal. Polarization, the polarization in this country has been going on for decades. Um, and those are deep currents. Uh, we've had it under Republican presidents and Democratic presidents. It's a complicated set of reasons, but the kind of Senator Danforth I know could, could testify, you had at one point sort of conservative leading Democrats and moderate Republicans, and they worked a lot together. There was what Bill Bishop, a journalist calls the big sort that happened in politics and in life. People began to sort according to lifestyle, according to political, ide political ideology. And so the, the crossover effect, the, the good pollinization that may happen with parties sort of broke apart and each side got more polarized. If you have a political system that is polarized, that's essentially creating the soil for conspiracy theories and truth deniers to, uh, to take, uh, take up. Also, we live in a um, deeply populist age um, and um, I'm a conservative, I'm not a populist. I think they're very different in some ways, they're antithetical. And populism historically, it, it can have, it can contribute uh, to, to particular moments in time because it can give voice to legitimate grievances. But populism unchecked uh, can be a dangerous thing because it ignites the passions of the people. And again, this is what the founders concerned about. Abraham Lincoln, when he was 20 years old, gave a speech, the Young Men's Lyceum speech, where he talked about mob mentality and, and uh, what that could do to, to, to this republic and the threat of law and truth. Um, so this is a populist age. It's an anti-establishment age. It's an anti-elitist age. Um, so that, uh, that is out there as well. Um, and then I agree with, with John, which is, uh, I had been a lifelong Republican until the Trump presidency is Marie said, I worked in three Republican administrations, um, but it's, um, it's with some degree of, of lament and, and, uh, and disappointment and even pain that I said that the Republican Party, to me, has become a, a, a kind of wrecking ball uh, in many respects on, on truth. It's not isolated uh, only to that, because I think you have a sort of pincer movement on the progressive left. You see on, on campuses and journalism and elsewhere. Uh, they too want to shut down truth. They too want to um, shut down um, de uh, debate. And the last thing I'll say is just there's been a kind of grievances that have grown up 
um, especially on the American right. I think some of those are under, overstated. I think some of them are legitimate. Um, people feeling that they've been dishonored and disrespected, that they've looked condescended to, their values are under attack. And you have these huge changes, economic changes, cultural changes. And that's a lot for a country and for people to adjust to. And it leaves them vulnerable uh, when they feel um, either under attack uh, or, um, or vulnerable to, to, uh, uh, to fear, to charges of fear. So all of these things have sort of come together and I think given us this, this moment, um, it's, and we'll get to this, it's not as if we can't come out of this moment, but it's a precarious one. And I think we have to be honest about that, name it, and then to begin to take steps to, to uh, get out of it. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for being here. It's a real pleasure. It's also a real honor to get to appear alongside two people I've admired for a long time, Pete Weiner and Jonathan Rausch. And not surprisingly, they covered the landscape in very well. So. Um, I'll just ladle a little bit of additional thoughts on top of that. And since we're in a center that talks a lot about religion and politics, in addition to the factors that Jonathan mentioned about an epistemic crisis that we're facing, what Pete talked about, a crisis of trust and a political crisis, I'll also just mention that part of this is also a civic crisis uh, that I would argue has some of its roots in a spiritual deformation. And what I mean by that is um, a couple things. One, I think that part of the problem is that politics has actually become too central to our identity. And what I mean by that is that uh, even 20 years or ago or so, it was far more likely for the average American to marry outside of their party than outside of their faith. Uh, religion was considered one of the unmoved movers of identity. That is your, your faith background often shaped other parts of your identity. That has all flipped. People are now far more likely to marry outside of their faith than outside of their party. Uh, one's political orientation forms more and more of what one thinks about oneself and one's kind of place in the world. Uh, and there was very real consequences to that. Relatedly, and uh, further exacerbating this, is that we more and more look for truth from sources that are both personalized as well as highly politicized in social media. There's good reasons, of course, for people to uh, have some doubts or distrust about traditional um, you know, media forms, institutions. Their institutions have failed from time to time. Uh, but one of the unsettling things is that distrust has not made us in the aggregate more discerning and more shrewd. It's actually made us in the aggregate more gullible more easily taken in by streams of information that confirm our biases and play to our grievances, rather than challenge some of our biases or unsettle some of our grievances. Uh, and a third area that I think speaks to kind of the combination of, of spiritual deformation that's fueling a civic crisis is that we are not only looking for more of our identity in politics, so our politics is uh, getting more, more central and more polarized, as well as more apocalyptic. We're looking for truth in fundamentally um, uh, unworthy and distorting means and information streams. But we're also increasingly looking for purpose in political combat. And a lot of our faith-based institutions, churches, uh, organizations, that there is a syncretism between political combat and ultimate ends. And of course, when you try to fuse the two, you're kind of left with a holy war that's largely fought online, where courage is often equated with belligerence. Uh, the refusal to listen or to compromise is somehow seen as principled conviction. Uh, and where giving quarter to one's antagonist is seen not as mercy or grace, um, but as cowardice or spinelessness or capitulation. So I, I do think that in addition to our, uh, our epistemic crisis, the crisis of trust, uh, there is a deeper both civic and, and religious crisis that is fueling this as well. Thank you all three so very much. And maybe to stick with the religion theme a little, I, I really appreciate you raising that. You know, one of the issues, uh, and Pete, you and I have talked about this, um, there's a lot of attention to white evangelicals these days and what's been called white Christian nationalism. 
um, the role of evangelicals in believing and spreading conspiracy theories. Uh, and so I, I, this movement that's supposedly about truth seems to have, uh, in many sectors at least, gotten so caught up uh, in all of this, this assault on, on truth. And I just wondered if I, I know Sheree and, and Pete, you both come from an evangelical background. I know, John, you speak as an outsider to that, but as someone in conversation with a lot of evangelicals, um, maybe we could have you speak to that uh, a bit. Pete, do you want to start? On sure, that? sure, yeah, I'm happy, happy to, uh, um, to do it. Uh, it's an important issue. Um, and I should say, I, I am a person of the Christian faith that's uh, I think most central to to uh, to my life, and the fact that um, not only of, has the assault on truth found its way into the into the Christian church, but the fact that in many instances I think the church is uh, accelerating that assault on truth is is is, um, is the most painful thing in terms of this uh, political and, re and religious moment. Why is that um, is that happening? Um, several things I would say that is at play. Um, one is uh, the, the history of the white evangelical church is important to bear in mind, and even history of Christianity uh, and science and, and, and truth um, over, uh, over the last hundred years. You had the Scopes Monkey Trial, um, and you have this sort of skepticism um, that exists. Tim, Tim Keller and others have talked about that within the evangelical movement um, that um, I think makes it more susceptible uh, to, to conspiracy theories. And then you have certain branches of, of Christianity, uh, Pentecostalism, which, um, which I think can, can, uh, can fall into that. There's also a, a fusion of a fundamentalist sensibility with the evangelical um, faith. Um, Mark Laverton, who's the president of Fourth Theological Seminary, has talked about that. And if you're familiar with the fundamentalist movement, and it has some things to recommend to it, but it tends to be anti-intellectual um, and very skeptical um, of, of, uh, of authority. Um, and, and that tension of, of uh, science and, and faith um, is, is, a, is something that's almost intrinsic, at least in, in some, some quarters of, uh, of Christianity. Um, the other thing that I would say, it's just been, a, a, I, I think, a, a, something of a, not a revelation exactly to me, something has hit me more forcibly, um, which is when, uh, when I started my Christian journey, which was sort of in high school and college, um, one of the things I was taken at was, was the, the notion of um, the transformative effects of faith and how that would become core to who one should be. And all of us have fallen short and falling short of the glory of God, as Paul says in Romans, but there was a sense that that was core to who one should be. That, that if you gave your allegiance to, to faith, um, it should influence and orient the rest of, of, of your life. I think what uh, I've seen more vividly in the last um, half dozen years, decade or so, is that I think a lot of people of the Christian faith, their core identity is actually not in faith. It's in culture, it's in sociology, it's in politics, or it's in partisanship. And they've sort of engrafted faith upon it. Um, and if you ask people whether that was happening, most of them would say no. I mean, they're, they're not cynical about this. Um, but we're all formed by our family of origins, cultural experiences, the country we live in, the race we are, uh, the gender we are, all of those things sort of form how we interpret things, including our faith. And so I think for a lot of people, the core identity is, are these other things. And when you engraft faith on that, then you sort of proof text the Bible because you can justify, as Shakespeare said, that the devil can quote scripture for his own purposes. 66 books, thousands of years, lots of circumstances and characters. So people begin to say, what are the verses that can reinforce what I already believe? And then the danger of that is politics is already a passionate enough enterprise by itself. And when you uh, superimpose on that the, the notion that I'm arguing not just for my beliefs in politics, but I'm arguing on behalf of God. And this is the children of light against the children of darkness. That adds an element to politics, which is really dangerous because then you get into this Manichaean mindset. And this is part of the, the, the checkered history of Christianity throughout, hit, throughout uh, world history. 
which is that a lot of times in the name of truth, uh, churches and, and, and people of the Christian faith have done, um, you know, have done terrible things. That isn't for a moment uh, to, to uh, um, uh, overlook or denigrate how faith has been an engine of justice throughout world history as well and in this own country. The abolitionist movement, the civil rights movement, um, the pro-life movement, as many uh, aspects of it that's, that's admirable. Uh, and then just the good that is done by millions and millions of Christians and churches on a daily basis to, to help people in the shadows of society. Um, and that needs to be recognized. It doesn't always get, get, its, get its attention. But um, there's no question in my mind that rather than being a healing agent in, our, in this political moment and in the context of truth, in far too many instances, um, the church, the Christian church, and individual Christians are, uh, are actually doing, uh, doing harm, uh, and it's harm to the country, and it's harm to the witness uh, of the Lord to whom they say they've given allegiance. Just to double click on that, um, C.S. Lewis talked about the temptation of what he called Christianity and, you know, in that there's great power in faith. And it's not surprising that lots of people would like to instrumentalize or hijack that power towards ends that they consider important. And so there's long been a temptation to try to claim the mantle of faith for one's uh, political project or cultural project or the like. But I think one other thing to kind of just ladle on to what uh, Pete was saying is, you know, where are kind of people spending most of their, their time and to what are they giving most of their attention? Um, we often think about kind of things that are going wrong within evangelical Christendom as uh, being, you know, a few, you know, well-known, highly politicized pastors who are leading people astray. And there's certainly a few of those. But, you know, there's also a recent Barna study out that found that over 40% of pastors within kind of the broad evangelical tradition had seriously considered leaving the pastorate within the last year. That's up from just, from 29%. Well, on a poll taken on January 7th of last year, you know, when things were not good, um, and it's gone up that much just in, you know, a year and a half's time. And a lot of that is because of what's happening, not on the grass tops level, but on the grassroots level um, among the laity. And many pastors talk about it's very difficult when you have, you know, two hours a week with someone who's spending, say, 40 hours a week, you know, listening to, you um, to right wing or left wing radio or um, social media or the like, you know, essentially they are being catechized uh, by something very different um, than, than a faith tradition, uh, but investing it with that same kind of energy. Filling to use it in those mm -hmm. terms. John, did you want to speak to this uh, issue also of Christians, evangelicals? I think I'll leave this one to my better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Well, um, we're going to get to what to do about it soon, and uh, we're also going to open it up to you all, so have no fear, but I, I do want to get into a couple more um, issues about uh, where we are now, which I think are important, and one is, um, you've mentioned, uh, I think, Pete and John both, um, those on the right, but also those on the left, and I sort of want to ask, you know, you all to delve in. John, maybe I'll start with you this time. Um, you know, who's more at fault on the far left or those on the far right, or really what has each side contributed to the assault on truth and our country's polarization? How, how do you think about that? I mean, I'm not a big fan of both sidesism when it doesn't fit, but maybe it fits in this case. Uh, it does not really fit. And the reason it does not fit is that there are problems on both sides. But in my view, others will disagree. But in my view, uh, the threat from the left is kind of like cancer. It's eating away at institutional values, including at universities where you're seeing, for example, I was just hearing today, a university, recent university graduate saying that her uh, women's studies program had been more interested in indoctrination than teaching. But, but those tend to be more slow acting problems, that kind of infestation of one-sidedness uh, and politicization in parts of universities. I think the political problem on the right the direct attack on our democracy, the use of mass disinformation to distort democracy, undermine democracy, making that actually the price of admission if you're a Republican politician, that's a heart attack. That's here, that's now, that's immediate. It is not clear where we are even in five years if we have a political class that is 
lying to us about the results of elections, acting on that basis. So I do not want to suggest that these two things are equivalent right now. That said, they're both serious. They feed off each other. Each one justifies its actions based on its perceived uh, threat from the other side. They're in that sense kind of symmetrical and they're both kind of right about the threat about the other side. So the challenge is, can you ratchet down the environment by bringing forth enough moderates in politics and in intellectual life at institutions like campuses um, and corporate HR departments and newsrooms who will assert the center. Um, and that means asserting, for example, the primacy of actual truth over whatever it is people would like to believe. In other words, the primacy of truth over truthiness. You all know truthiness, right? Colbert coined it, but it's, it's a pretty sophisticated idea, which is the notion that uh, if we think something should be true, then it probably is true. Uh, we got to forswear that on the left and right. Um, in places like newsrooms and academia, we have to do a better job of making sure there's viewpoint diversity alongside of other kinds of diversity. That's sorely lacking in, uh, for example, a lot of anthropology and sociology departments, and that's distorting scholarship. It's costing, uh, it's costing those departments and academia a lot of public trust. It means on the right, standing up to MAGA, um, it means that Liz Cheney is correct in principle, not saying there's the power to do this at the moment, but in principle, all election deniers should be denied office. It should be made clear that if you are lying about our democracy systematically for political gain, that should not be acceptable. And that's gonna be up to the voters. We'll find out something about that in three weeks. So um, not quite symmetrical, but both sides are involved. Do you agree with that, Pete? Yeah, I do, I do. I, it, there, there is a problem. I, I think on the, uh, on the left, um, I think it's, it's, it's confined more to certain institutions and they're important institutions. Um, it's not true, as I think, as, as, as we've discovered, uh, even in our time here and, and with students so much at this university, but a lot of universities, there's just no question. There's kind of a thought police and a, and a quasi totalitarian uh, mindset. And both John and I know people in uh, journalism and media where there is uh, sometimes stated and sometimes unstated pressure of uh, places that you can't go or things you can't write, things you can't do. Otherwise, there's going to be sort of a mob, a social media mob, a left-wing mob, and it's real. But I do think that the, um, the assault on, um, on truth uh, from, from the right is more immediate and more urgent. Um, and, uh, and, and I feel like that's in, in part because you know, the, the Republican Party nominated a person um, who has uh, a, um, uh, I think is sociopathic in, in many important ways, which on an individual level is, uh, is tragic. Um, but when you nominate a person and then elect a person uh, with those tendencies, uh, who has not just the disregard for truth, but almost actively engages, actively enjoys assaulting it, um, and then you give, give that person the power of the presidency and, and then a political party um, basically stays with him. So uh, if he blows through you know, all of the, the, the barriers uh, that, uh, that have traditionally existed in American life and American politics, and then the question becomes, at what point does that party say no to that? And so far we've tested that proposition and the Republican party hasn't said no to it. That's really dangerous. I do want to say one thing that's at least tangentially related to this point. And we talked about this some with your with the students earlier today. Um, but I do think that there, it's it has to do with the nature of the polarized, angry state of of our debate, the confirmation bias, the sense that you know we're in a fight to the death to defend what we believe in. And I think that. All of us as citizens need to recalibrate a little bit. What is the point in, for political dialogue, dialogue in any, in any realm, theological dialogue as well? I think, remote, and I'm speaking for myself here too, often as we get into these debates because we're convinced at the outset that we're absolutely right. And our task is to overwhelm the other person and convince them that they're wrong. First, that doesn't work. 
almost, we, this is not, if you, if you know human psychology, the more you overwhelm people just with, 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 with data and arguments, the more likely they are to dig in their heels, to push back. If you like, especially on important issues, if you feel like your core identity is under attack, then you're going to, 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 to lash back. But in fact, what is really the purpose of dialogue and debate? If you believe, as I think we should, in the sort of epistemological modesty, this notion that we want to find truth, but none of us can do it on our own because of the limitations of human reason and human insight. And so we need each other to be in conversation, to help each other see our blind spots. And so we can actually apprehend truth. Uh, we were talking er earlier today, but there's this lovely description in Surprised by Joy, which is the autobiography of, of C.S. Lewis. And Lewis talked about first friends and second friends. And the first friend is, is a Lewis with Arthur Grieve, somebody he had met when he was very young. And Lewis described the first friend as, a, uh, as the alter ego. You start the sentence, your friend can complete it. Yeah, it's a person who has a similar uh, worldview. And he uses the lovely description of raindrops on, on, on a pane of window in which they come and join together. And we all need first, first friends. That's part of what it means to be part of, part of a community. He describes something called second friends, who's um, not your alter ego, but, 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 but your anti-self. Um, and Lewis said that's the person that you read the same uh, books and the other person draws all the wrong conclusions from, from them. Um, and it, for him, it was a person named Owen Barfield, and they had gotten into these debates on somewhat esoteric issues, but they were real intense debates. And so when Lewis is writing about his second friend, he, he describes that they would go at it hammer and tong late into the night and how almost imperceptibly they would begin to shape each other's uh, views. And this was a lovely friendship for both Barfield and Lewis. Um, and the reason that they loved the friendship and loved each other was they felt like they were better because they were in each other's lives, helping them to see blind spots they didn't have. And Barfield said later, he said, when, when Lewis and I debated, we never debated for victory, we debated for truth. And it's a huge difference. If you go into a conversation with somebody and it's to beat them for victory or is it to engage in, in, uh, in, in a back and forth so you can better see see truth. And I just think that kind of recalibration of what dialogue is in our daily lives, in our national life, could help a lot um, to depolarize us and get us back on the right, uh, right path. Well, um, Pete and John are the real experts on this. But one thing I'll just add that kind of uh, bounces off of Pete's point about friendship is a factor that makes us all more susceptible to the, uh, especially what's going on in the right, is when we have it named exactly, we sort of danced around it, and that's loneliness. Um, and that may seem a little bit counterintuitive, like what would loneliness have to do with it? Um, but there, there is a fairly, I think, direct connection to um, making us vulnerable to, to this kind of uh, hunger for misinformation, as well as gullibility to it. Uh, and that, you know, there have been a lot of studies showing how not only are kind of like the thick institutions to which we belong kind of in decline, different associations of friendship itself is in decline. We are much less likely to say that we have any close friend you know, than we were 20 years ago. Um, and that does leave us looking for community. You know, we are wired, we are not made to be alone. Uh, we're wired for community. And uh, the combination of the breakdown of institutions and neighborhoods and communities and the uh, decline of friendship, uh, as well as a pandemic that's you know, kept us all quarantined at home at various times has had us looking uh, for, for love in all the wrong places. You know, we've gone looking for community online. And the kind of community that's formed online is rarely about you know, deep knowledge, personal knowledge and caring for another person. It's almost always about shared affiliations or associations. Uh, and one of the first rules in politics, of course, is it's much easier to rally people around a shared, uh, a shared hatred or grievance than it is a shared love or proposal. And uh, you know, algorithms have gotten very good. You know, internet companies are have gotten very good at keeping our attention. And usually, the way they do this is by feeding us information that confirms all of our biases, 
or gets us really riled up at how evil or stupid our antagonists are. Uh, and we go kind of further and further down that hole um, where we're losing actual human contact uh, while getting more and more confirmed of our own correctness and the utter venality and idiocy of those who disagree with us. You know, Hannah Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarianism talked about how it was a people who were kind of disassociated from each other that were the most susceptible to misinformation. And I think that's kind of where we are and part of why uh, the, the misinformation heart attack that John describes has had, um, has been so, uh, so effective. Mm. I think that's a wonderful point, the social consequences of loneliness, mm -hmm. you know, as being really critical and something that probably doesn't get enough attention and, and conversation. Um, I'd like to continue. I think, Pete, you kind of got us uh, going here. Today at lunch, one of our wonderful religion and politics minors, uh, I think it was Carly, I don't know if she's here with us or she may be on the Zoom, but she asked you all a question about talking across these complicated lines. And she had a, a story. Uh, she recently went to her brother's wedding and got into, it sounds like, a very painful argument with her uncle over abortion. Um, she's very strongly on the pro-choice side and her uncle was not. And she, they started out trying to have a conversation about this and it just avalanched as she put it. And she wanted to know, you know, what are some tools? This kind of helps us get to what do we do about it? But what are the tools? You all have some really thoughtful answers, I think, for that um, of how to talk across uh, these, these difficult social issues. John, maybe I'll start with you uh, on that. Uh, sure, there's, there's a lot of, as you all will imagine, a lot of research in the last few years that's been initiated on this question of you know, various versions of, so what do I do about my QAnon relative who's completely out of touch with reality? Is there a way to retrieve this person? Um, and what the research seems, seems to show is that what does not work is to approach them with the idea of correcting their facts. That seems to actually make people more defensive and make them dig in. What seems to be more effective although challenging at a personal level, is to initiate a conversation from a point of view of genuine curiosity and interest in that person. There's a saying that I've seen attributed to Dale Carnegie, the famous author of the famous How to Win Friends and Influence People. I haven't verified this, but it sounds right, which is you cannot make people agree with you, but you can make people want to agree with you. Um, and a way to do that is to express curiosity and interest, do listening before talking. Um, I'm associated with a wonderful group called Braver Angels, which is a national grassroots depolarizing movement. Uh, and the head of that, the founder, David Blankenhorn says that the most effective way to begin one of these conversations is with the question, um, what life experiences have led you to this belief? Which has a couple of effects. First, it personalizes the conversation. It's genuine interest opens people up. And second, it translates the axes away from facts and warring facts to the world of storytelling and experience where people are naturally more comfortable. And this will, this will be a way to ease into the conversation and to put both people in a frame of mind where they're more interested in learning. And it turns out that's actually better for getting the person you're talking to to start asking themselves the hard questions. Does it really make sense you know, that there was a conspiracy to, by Hillary Clinton to traffic children um, and eat them or, or whatever? Uh, a second thing which is very helpful is to, to try to restate in, in the best way you can the, your, um, your interlocutor's position. You say something like, so Sharif, am I understanding correctly that your view is X, Y, and Z? Because if Sharif feels heard, if she feels I'm really making the effort to understand, that will, uh, that will also lower those defenses. So those are the kinds of things that make for better conversations. But of course, it's going to be hard, right? Because we're all working against the media environment, which is, as, uh, as we've said today, is in the business of triggering outrage, putting defenses up, demonizing the other side. The good news is that, that Braver Angels, for example, is getting really good results. The most common statement that people make after walking away from a Braver Angels debate or workshop, these are not designed to change minds or even common ground. They're just designed to help us Reestablish the civic habit of engaging with people who disagree with and showing us how to do that. It's based on family therapy. Most common reaction is 
we're not as divided as we've been led to believe. And that is in fact true. Polls show that people overestimate by about double the policy differences, the actual substantive disagreements that they have with the other side. We are not as divided as we've been led to believe. And a lot of what we can do is just understand that about each other. Okay. Yeah, I think that really was well, well put. Um, I'm just gonna underscore some of what John said and then, and then share an anecdote, which I think maybe helps it helps illustrate it. Um, but this idea of being heard is 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 a really big deal. And uh, whether you've experienced that in political debate, almost everybody has, I'm sure, experienced that just in life. Um, and you think about if you're in a marriage with with uh, with your spouse or or a friendship, um, and if you um, have an area of disagreement, um, if uh, the response uh, is uh, you know, if, if one person mentions the things that have hurt them or upset them, and the response of the spouse or the friend is to go through the litany of grievances that you have against them, you're not going to get anywhere um, at all. So people have to feel heard, and there has to be a genuine interest, curiosity about uh, about where where uh, where these people are. So John had mentioned that. Um, I think also that there is a real virtue to a, to a pretty simple discipline, which is um, to think for yourself or even to have conversations with other people of what is the best uh, argument, good faith argument for the other side. Um, I, I was a visiting professor at Duke and one of the assignments that I gave students was um, I listed uh, several issues. Um, gay rights, um, guns, race, and abortion. And my assignment was choose one of those topics and write the best paper you can against the view that you hold. And then I would grade them to see on how strong of an argument that they made. By the way, some professors had warned me against doing that because they thought, well, this is, these, these uh, topics are too hot. To, to do on on uh, on a campus, but I went ahead and did it, and it wasn't a problem. So on the issue of abortion, there was the NARAL representative, pro-choice representative on the Duke campus, who wrote her paper on a pro-life perspective. And so when we gathered after those assignments were done, um, and we just talked, I with I was talking with the students, and I asked this woman uh, about how how that uh, experience was, and she said it was very painful. But she said, I actually felt that I understood the other side better. She didn't change her mind, but she did, did understand it uh, better. Uh, and the last point that I'll make um, on, on this, uh, and I, I don't know exactly how to scale this up, but at least on an individual basis, I think this kind of thing is important and, uh, uh, and, and can work. And that is that if you have standing in other people's lives in the realms beyond politics, um, then that opens the way for genuine and authentic political discussion. If people feel like they, they can trust you and that you have an interest in their, in their lives uh, beyond the political. Um, there's a person that I know who's a right-wing radio talk show host. I've known him for several years. I had written a piece in the New York Times critical of Trump. He was upset, wrote me an email. We had a back and forth. You tell the temperature was going up. You know, 10 years earlier, I would have written a 10 page point by point rebuttal to everything he said. And as Cherie, we used to work together, can tell you I'm capable of doing something like that. <laughs> that, would have, uh, that would have achieved precisely nothing of good. It wouldn't have convinced him he was wrong. Uh, it may have been temporarily therapeutic for me, but then I would have had to have circled back to repair the friendship because I know what, what that would have catalyzed. So instead, I uh, wrote him and I said, look, uh, because he made some charges, I said, I'm not going to really answer those unless you really want me to, but let me tell you why I think we're talking past each other. And I did the best good faith job I could to say, I think this is how you view me as a critic of Trump. You feel like I've been a lifelong Republican, that I've sort of become a traitor to the cause. You feel like that Trump is being waylaid every single day in the mainstream media, and you're not going to throw logs on that bonfire. You feel like the success of Trump is tied to the success of the country 
And even if he's an imperfect person, he still needs to, to win. You feel like I should know better than that uh, because causes that I've believed in are ones he largely is championing and I should be there. And so for him, it was this notion of loyalty, you know, sort of trumps the quarterback, we're the offensive line, our job is to protect him. And you feel like I'm not only not protecting him, I'm actually trying to sack him. And uh, so for him, it's, it's loyalty. I said, for me, the thing was that uh, I'm trying to achieve or that I'm that at least trying to think about myself in the context is, is intellectual integrity, which is I asked the question, if, if Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama had done the same thing as Donald Trump had done, uh, and I had criticized them harshly, then what am I going to say if somebody on my team does it? Am I going to use the same standard of judgment? Or does the R or the D beside your name determine the arguments that, that, that I make? And I said, for me, what I'm trying to achieve is to say, what is the honest thing to do here? And so when I described those two different views in a couple of paragraphs each, and I, and I did it as a dispassionate a way as I could, um, and he wrote me back and he said, I've read this now two or three times. He said, it was like a light bulb going on. And I remember the line that he used. He said, you know, you're right. I'm not uh, interested in objectivity. He said, I'm an advocate. That's what I do. Um, but it opened the way to a conversation that we continued to have. And then months later, I was driving GW Parkway in DC and there had been a, a shooting, a high school shooting. And one of the high school students was leading an effort to uh, on the Second Amendment uh, to, to, to for gun control. And the, the guy said on a show when I was listening to it, he said, it's fine to argue for the Second Amendment. But he said, don't go after the students. These uh, students have been through a trauma. He said, I have socks that are as old as some of these students. Basically back off. And I, when I heard that, I got to the office, I wrote him an email and I said, thanks. I, I heard what you were saying and I appreciate the fact that you were uh, telling your audience not to go after high school students. And I thought that was an admirable thing to do. And he wrote me back and he said, thanks, I appreciated that. And he said, that voice you heard on the radio wasn't just mine, it was yours too. And what he meant by that is it was a product of sort of the conversation that, that we had. And he called me as recently as probably two months ago, um, just to share his own sort of dark fears about Donald Trump. Um, because he's not doing it publicly, I wish he would. But it did say something about how the fact that we had a relationship, we knew something about each other's lives, sort of calmed things down, the barriers went down, and he feels like I can share some of this stuff. And if, if we had just had an argument and I was just pounding him with facts and evidence and that was all, you know, we wouldn't be there. Yeah, as, as John said, it's part of these models come out of family therapy, marriage counseling. Mm -hmm. Some of this sounds mm -hmm. a lot like techniques there, and it's a, about these relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Building them up. Three. You know, I'll, I'll just add, and this sort of piggybacks on some of what has been said already. One thing um, that's worth keeping in mind is whether the engagement is essentially about understanding or about domination. Um, and so many of our kind of conversations around politics are really about. Uh, trying to win victory, dominate, embarrass, uh, triumph over uh, someone else, even the language uh, that we use. And um, you know, there's a lot of research on this. You've mentioned family therapy. You know, many of you are probably familiar with John Gottman about uh, essentially expressions of contempt are one of the, the best predictors of divorce. You know, usually expressions of domination or contempt will, will, will kill any uh, possibility for understanding. Uh, there's there's evidence to suggest that essentially expressions of contempt make us almost unable to understand what's being said uh, because essentially we get an adrenaline rush, we go into a fight or flight mode. Uh, it shuts down the possibility of, of real communication, much less connection. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, is one of the, the primary modes of discourse that we have, social media, a lot of this really rewards uh, expressions of domination, expressions of contempt, the quick snarky takedown, and, and doesn't reward you know, longer, more gracious attempts at understanding and connection. Uh, there will be times I think one has to choose between wanting to understand and wanting to connect um, and the, the quick hit of 
attention, likes, retweets, whatever else one might get through that particular uh, form of discourse. Thank you. I'm just going to ask one last question for each of you to reflect on, and then we will open it up to you all. We have two mics, uh, so I'll make sure uh, you all get to uh, ask your questions, too. You've all talked now about what to do on an interpersonal level, which I think is crucial, and we know things start there uh, on the interpersonal. But I know from this audience, uh, our conversations in the past, people are also concerned about what to do for the larger society. And I just wondered, you know, you've kind of mentioned social media, you know, Braver Angels is sort of a model, but could you all just maybe offer your best ideas for what ordinary people can do um, to really help uh, improve our politics, our society at, at larger levels as well? John? Well, that's a, a big question, uh, and there's a chunk of a book about it, which, by the way, is available uh, <laughs> to you today. Um, the short answer is that there's no short answer, because there are two levels of things that, that need to be addressed. One is the personal level, and that's the things we can do in our own epistemic environment to uh, support the constitution of knowledge, the rules, the norms, the institutions that keep us anchored to truth. But the other, just as important, are changes at the institutional level. That's places like mainstream media, um, social media, academia, um, law, and other places where changes need to be made. Um, so what are we talking about? Well, lots of different things. At the personal level, there's something each of us can do in our own environment. If we're part of the reality-based community, that's academia and science and research, number one, journalism, number two, law, number three, uh, and government, number four. These are the, the institutions that must be anchored to reality or else society goes off an epistemic and governmental cliff. There's something each of us can do in that environment, uh, whether it's at a faculty meeting, uh, resisting politicization or saying, we need to make sure we're friendlier to conservatives in this environment or, for example, in a newsroom. Um, I was at a, a gathering like this one a couple months ago and someone raised her hand and said, so I am a specialist in uh, Chinese diplomatic relations. What can I do in my world to advance the values of truth? And I said, well, of course, I don't know the answer to that. You do. Sit down with a legal pad and I'll bet in 30 minutes you can come up with things that will make your environment safer, more hospitable to truth that will, for example, uh, support a culture that is open where cancelers are not rewarded, for example. So I turn that question about individuals back to each of you because there are things you can do in your environment and only you know what they are. At the institutional level, um, here again, there's no one answer because all of these institutions play different roles, but we're talking about stuff like social media has been designed to propagate outrage at high speed because outragement is engagement. You get clicks that way, you sell ads. Um, a lot of the social media platforms now realize that that's a toxic formula. And so there need to be changes in the way the algorithms work, more transparency. They need to slow things down so people are more reflective, for example, before they retweet and repost. They're increasingly doing things like putting up um, what are called interstitial warnings. So if you try to tweet something without reading it, you'll get a sign that says, are you sure you don't want to read this first? Just slowing people down turns out to help engage our non-lizard brains, our thoughtful brains. Um, so there's things like that in social media and mainstream newsrooms. We need to do a better job of bringing in um, points of view that are not on the left. Because if everyone in the newsroom is on the left, we're not going to be telling telling the whole story. Academia has a ton of work to do. Places like Heterodox Academy, Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education are working hard to make academia more welcoming to diverse points of view and to make sure they defend free speech and the values of free speech on campus. Uh, adopting the Chicago principles on campus, those are free speech principles. Uh, um, those kinds of institutional changes. I could go on and on. And the point is, you don't want to hear me list lots of stuff because it's really boring. The point is that all of us as individuals and institutions, there is stuff that we can do. And you guys out there are the best people at figuring out what those things are in your environment. And the good news is the constitution of knowledge, the system that we have that anchors us to truth, that prevents us from going to war over truth and falling victim to totalitarian lies, has been under assault for 300 years. 
This is just the latest iteration. And if we do our job, if we defend it, the system that we have that anchors us to reality is the only system that can produce knowledge. It is the only one that can put into my arm the vaccines that are protecting me from COVID right now. The other systems that we're talking about today, the canceling, the mass disinformation are purely nihilistic, parasitic, and opportunistic. They cannot make knowledge. They cannot find truth. They can only tear it down. And that means if we do our job of figuring out how to defend these institutions and then doing it, we squash the other side like a bug because we are the only ones who can offer freedom, knowledge, and truth. I should have said freedom, knowledge, and peace. Freedom, knowledge, and peace. No, that's, that's beautifully, beautifully said. Um, I, I think about it in some ways like, like John does. I think about it institutionally and then, and then individually. Um, on the institutional side, um, he, he named some of them. Uh, I do think uh, you know, social media reforms is, is, a, is a big part of this. Um, John knows more about it. He studied it more than I have. There, there are others. Um, but uh, in that great book that you can buy after this event that John wrote, uh, he goes through, and actually, I think, John, I'm right in saying that if you compare 2016 to 2020, there has there has been some degree of improvement. Significant improvement, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is us sort of catching up in terms of technology with, with what the problem is. We're sort of back on our heels in, in, in the um, mid-2010s, uh, and, and we're making changes there. I think there's some reforms to look at that are potentially helpful in politics. Um, and again, politics is, is driving a lot of this problem through the polarization, um, but there's ranked choice voting and open primaries um, that seem to, to um, be showing early signs of, of success. There are things like uh, voluntary national service, which um, I find appealing. Uh, and I think there's early evidence that that can help. And the idea of voluntary national service is that you get people from different walks of life, different race, different income, different class, and they work together in a common project. And the anonymity that is uh, necessary to create the, the, the hate and the assault, the antipathy that we have toward one another begins to fa fade when you actually are dealing with real people, particularly in, um, in a common cause. Um, I would say that there's one institution, uh, partly because of my history, but partly because I think it's important to look at is, is, is the church. Um, and uh, there are two people, um, friends of mine, Curtis Chang and David French, who are going to start an initiative in which they they want to try and help the, to a word that Cherie mentioned, catechize people of the Christian faith, uh, not from the pulpit, but I think through adult education classes on how the proper way for uh, people of faith to engage in, in, in politics. And it's not the, the what of politics, not the issues, but the how. Eugene Peterson uh, had a lovely phrase. He talked about the Jesus truth and the Jesus way. And he said, you can't support the Jesus truth if you're not using the Jesus way. And we're not seeing much of the Jesus way within politics. So Curtis and David wanna work on curriculum and videos and helping people within churches to say, Look, we got a problem. We want to name this problem. We don't want to. We don't want to turn our, our, uh, our uh, eyes from it. We don't want to be partisan as churches, but we want to try and give uh, a a way for for people of faith to engage with with integrity uh, in politics and in culture, so we can be light and salt uh, and healing agents to a world that that needs it. And the last thing I, I would say is, uh, it's not a, a reform, but I, I suppose it's a, it's a mindset um, of, of sorts, which is to keep in mind that one person acting alone you know, can't make a difference, but a lot of people acting together can make cultural change. Um, and things that look impossible uh, can, uh, can become true. Uh, whatever you think about the argument for same-sex marriage, John Rausch, along with Andrew Sullivan, made a whole series of arguments in the late 80s and early 90s, mid 90s, uh, for the case for same-sex marriage. And one of the things I appreciated about, about John in that debate is he never uh, t uh, tore into his opponents, never went ad hominem. He just sort of went through, made the case for his, for his view. And so an issue that 
in that you would have thought was impossible in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, be, became now 70% of the country believes in it, more than half of Republicans do. Again, whatever your views are on the on the merits of that particular issue, my point here is that the capacity to change minds and hearts can happen, and sometimes it can happen quicker than than you um, than you think. And then the last thing I'll say in in, in this re regard is, um, I think the way to think about any large and important endeavor in life is that you're called to be uh, faithful, not necessarily successful. And you, we all would rather be both. <laughs> um, but often you don't have control over whether your efforts are successful or not. That depends on circumstances you can't fully control. But all of us have the capacity to be faithful, um, to act with integrity, to act with honor, to, 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 to be agents of, of, of healing uh, to, um, to a broken world um, and to for standing the truth even in, in an age of, uh, of lies. Um, that's all anybody can ask of you as an individual. Um, and after that, um, it's, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how life, life unfolds. Um, but it's important to do that. And it's important that people who care about these issues not become cynical or fatalistic or withdraw from the field. Because a lot of people care about the same issues that you do. And I think John is right. You'll, the truth will prevail but it'll only prevail if there are people who are willing to defend it and defend it in the in the right uh, in the right way. Um, so I guess it's just a caution against uh, against uh, fatalism. Well, it's hard to improve on uh, the litany of suggestions you've just heard. So I'll just add one quirky suggestion as well as a comment. And uh, the quirky suggestion I would have is uh, communal, not just individual and not institutional, but it's start a reading group. And that might sound really odd, uh, but here's why I say that. You know, we have been talking a lot this evening about the ways in which loneliness, uh, in the ways in which our preoccupation with social media, um, our distraction, uh, superficiality, and over-reliance on politics has all helped fuel uh, the assault on truth. And, and what is a small book club or small reading group? It's a group of people united in looking, paying close attention to a worthy text in the spirit of hospitality and community. In many ways, it is a tiny little cultural antibody to the, the toxins that we have been talking about coursing through the body politic. And it's something that is small that just about anybody can do uh, and is a little microcosm of a better body politic, a better polis. Um, I would also kind of encourage read literature, read really good literature rather than a political book. And that literature necessarily requires kind of empathy and imagination as opposed to just kind of going straight to uh, reasoning and analysis and the like. It engages the right brain as well as the, as the left. So again, quirky, but um, in many ways it is, I guess one could almost call it a, a civic liturgy. You know, it's an embodied formational practice that orients us in a very different way. Uh, and then the, the comment that I'll, I'll make is that, um, you know, again, we're, we're in the Danforth Center. I, I do think uh, my own faith tradition is Christian. I do think the church will play, has to play a really important role in this, uh, in being the institution that, that does orient us towards a, what we believe is ultimate truth uh, and, are, and should be forming what we love. Um, and of course, you know, the essence of Christianity love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does it mean to love one's neighbor? I think it's fair to say that um, our, the assault on truth, the polarization that we're uh, seeing, the, the contempt, all of this is antithetical to that. And so um, I hope and do believe that the church will play a role as well. Three incredibly thoughtful answers. Thank you. Now it's your turn uh, for questions. I'd especially love to hear from students, if any, if any have. So we've got Jared Edelman, one of our other wonderful RNP uh, minors here. Get us going. Awesome. Uh, thank, you. thank you to all three of you. Um, to kind of touch on the points of like effective polarization, loneliness, sorting kind of along cultural cleavages, um, a lot of kind of solutions have been along like the response to bowling alone and that sort of thing, and to get more social fabric and cross-cutting 
uh, institutions to bring people together. Maybe it's a reading group. Um, I'd like to love that idea. Um, one question I kind of have and have thought on is, is religion a necessary part of that or are religious institutions a necessary part of that? If it's sufficient for you, I'd love to hear that take, but I'm not sure that's going to be there. Um, and if so, what do people, given kind of increasing secularization, who are not involved with the religious faith, do and kind of what is a good substitute for a religious institution? Well, I'm going to volunteer for that one because I'm not religious. <laughs> I'm an atheistic homosexual Jew. So I think I'm ideally qualified to comment on religion. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm grabbing that. You, you guys can be quiet. <laughs> You're biased. So the founders did not expect liberal democracy to answer our spiritual needs, give us fulfillment in life, and settle the big questions like, why are you here? They just expected it to set up a system that arbitrates our disputes in a fairly regular way and, and turns us toward compromise and persuasion instead of coercion and violence. And they succeeded in that, but they counted on a substrate of what they called Republican virtue. And, and for that, they counted on the propagation of those values in um, especially, not only, but especially in religious institutions. And so is it possible to have a liberal democracy without a functioning substrate of pro-social, civic-minded, pluralistic religion? It's possible, but it's much harder. Um, I think the answer is that there really is, put it this way, 20 years ago, I wrote a piece for Atlantic lauding what I called apathyism, which is the idea, you know, actually people don't care much about God anymore, one way or the other, and that's a real advance because now we don't have to argue about religion. Probably the dumbest thing I've ever written. <laughs> Because it turns out that if American religious institutions are not doing their job of providing a greater vision, um, a thicker sense of community, a sense of purpose in life, and undergirding civic values, the substitutes are worse. Everything from Soul Cycle to um, uh, QAnon, uh, wokeness, these divide us further, but they don't provide that civic substrate. They actually uh, they actually do the opposite. So what we're discovering now is that if religion falls asleep at the helm, uh, the boat starts to sink. Can it survive? Yeah, it probably can, but it's way harder if people like Cherie and Pete and their friends in the religious world don't step up. I agree with the atheists. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Raise them high, okay, I see you back there. Um, hi, thank you to all three of y'all and Dr. Griffith for moderating. Another um, religion and politics minor, I will say. I <laughs> see you with the lights coming in, but thank you. Um, this question kind of just stems like from like my own interest and like what I'm studying here. I'm a psychology major and like Dr. Griffith said, a religion and politics minor. So like, I understand if you may not have an answer to this, but going back to when y'all are discussing like, um, conversations with relatives who have like fallen into like QAnon conspiracies and also just have very polar like political beliefs from your own. Um, some of the things you were kind of talking about was like actively listening to like what they have to say and demonstrating like interest and like genuine curiosity, um, which are kind of like aspects of psychotherapy. Do y'all know if like any research has been done on like the effectiveness of psychotherapy with people who have like fallen into like the QAnon rabbit hole or who have caused like major tensions and like families and like relationships. Want me, you, you wanna start? Um, I, I don't know of any research and I would say it's the wrong way to think about it because these people are not sick. Therapy is a disease model, right? Um, and I think persuasion is an allyship model where even if you disagree, uh, you don't assume the other person is broken and need fixing. You assume that maybe you're both broken and imperfect. And you, although working in contention, that you're working toward an allied goal. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't locate it on the clinical psychology grid. Yeah, I'll just add because uh, I agree with with what John said there. Um, I would say that uh, understanding politics in the prism of psychology has been a huge help to me. Um, I think I. I uh, That's true. I have a much better appreciation for what um, is happening in the in the world of politics, and honestly, in the world of faith, 
by understanding uh, better um, how the human mind works and how human psychology does. My, my daughter, I mentioned earlier, graduated in uh, her major was in psychology. She's going to go on to do uh, her PhD in psychology. And we've had a lot of conversations where I've been asking her questions when I'm driving and she can take the notes on the, on her answers, but it's like, help me understand what is happening. What's the dynamic that's going on. Um, and the, the whole areas of motivated reasoning and confirmation bias, and what it means when your core identity is, is it, you feel like it's, it's under attack. How do you listen? Well, uh, what, what provokes people, what triggers people to keep them from, from uh, listening? Well, all those things is, much uh, more helpful to me. And as I was alluding to earlier, I think I've changed, not as much as I should, but I think I've changed my own personal interaction with people in the realm of of politics and theology, um, not as a trick to get them to believe what I believe and just say, well, here's I'm gonna go through the side door rather than the front door, Um, but actually to sort of understand them more, more fully. And again, um, you know, the easiest thing in the world is to see the blind spots of another person. Um, I mean, I can see them in, in instantaneously, and you probably can too. One of the harder things in life is to what your own blind spots are. That's why they're called blind spots, um, because we, we, we don't see it. Um, and that's just something that I think we have to, um, but again, the, you know, epistemic modesty, it's this notion the truth exists, but what I was alluding to earlier, we need each other to try and apprehend it. The best any of you in this audience or any of us has is we have a slice of truth. We, we have an angle of truth that is deep and true, but that's limited um, and, it's, and it's confined and, 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 uh, uh, and mitigated by all sorts of experiences that that we have. So I just want to come back to underscore that notion of being in community with, with one another and, 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 uh, and listening and being open to recalibration of our own views, not just recalibrating the views of, of others. That's a much better answer than the answer I, I gave. I've learned huge amounts from psychology about the position that we're in. And is there a book you would recommend to Walker and others? Interested there in is. You're thinking about? <laughs> it's called The Constitution of Knowledge. Okay, it's there you go. After this meeting. I'd actually recommend The Righteous Mind. I've read both. John, and, right. and, uh, right. No, that one's good too. <laughs> the, uh, he's not kidding, actually. I learned a huge amount from John's. Uh, one of his gifts as, as, as a writer and a journalist is the ability to uh, synthesize complicated stuff in an accessible way, but that is actually... Uh, sophisticated. So the two books that I would recommend would be John's, The Constitution of Knowledge, and The Righteous Mind by, uh, by, by John, uh, John Hyde. H-A-I-D-T is how you spell that. Yeah. Last question. Hi. Um, I don't know how to ask phrases of the question, so if you just comment, but I share your apprehension about populism, but it seems to me the current state of affairs is from an over-empowerment of minority view, because as you said, we're actually not as divided as it seems, but it's this megaphone to minority view that I think is twofold, low voter turnout, I don't, but also something that nobody talks about, which was the Permanent Apportion Act that capped the House of Representatives at 435, and we tripled our population. We still have the same number of representation despite these population centers that get much less of their point of view represented in the Electoral College and in the House of Representatives. Just comment. There's a case for that. Um, it's, a, it's a different conversation, I think. Okay, I guess we have time for one more. Thank you so much. Oh, I've never asked a question. Um, I Are you a student? I am a student. Um, I'm a minor in the uh, center. Um, I guess I want to say a couple things. One, there were several things that you said, which I agreed with um, about interpreting each other at our most charitably and, um, you know, pro-social um, communities and all of that, like I find extremely compelling and resonant with my own view. 
Um, I guess something that I'm wondering about is sort of the angle of power here, which is um, I feel like this is something that I something that I noticed when we when you were talking about I think uh, Jonathan um, when you were talking about um, sort of change in institutions to sort of um, you know propel I guess or I guess uh, you mentioned like HR departments or or changing institutions to help there be more sort of crosstalk I guess or more a little more padding for um, for helping people to feel more comfortable in all sorts of environments, which I do think is important. I guess something I'm wondering about is um, from the about white evangelicals and um, sort of the conservative or a conservative. Sorry, I'm not being very articulate, but I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't know how much. Uh, people on the left are willing to give up on um, sort of racial uh, progress or equity or hum or rights um, when it concerns identities. Um, sort of in the from the perspective of um, of white conservatives in the country who may feel a perceived loss of power, and I think that the perceived that the loss of power is. Is is also real and comes along with demographic shifts, as it was were mentioned. Um, but I guess for me, that's an element, an elephant in the room of sort of who has had power and who has not. Um, and I really appreciate all of you being here today. I'm just curious to hear what your comments would be. So thank you. Um, who has power and who does not? I don't think anyone loses power by having a conversation and seeking to learn. I think we gain power that way. Um, I approached a lot of people about same-sex marriage at a time when it was such a crazy idea. My father warned me not even to get involved with it because I would ruin my reputation as a serious writer and thinker. And I found that I gained power by having difficult conversations with people who didn't necessarily want to hear what I had to say. Every civil rights movement, African Americans, women, gay people, now trans people, and everyone else, the source of their power for social change has been fundamentally speech and ideas, approaching people and changing their mind. And no guarantees, and it doesn't work quickly, but that is the most empowering single thing that minorities have always had. And that is why authorities, whoever they may be, black or white or, um, straight or gay in an environment, once they get power, often the first thing they will try to do is shut down people who disagree with them. So if you care about a fair society and about minority rights, I think that you want to defend the open society where hard conversations can happen and where we have to encounter people we deeply and fundamentally disagree with and even think are bigoted and unpleasant because first, they may have something to teach us. And second, we may succeed in teaching them. I think there was a mic drop moment. <laughs> I, I'll just screw up the mic drop moment and add one, <laughs> one, one thought to it. Um, I actually have sympathy very much for what you say, and I think that has to be taken into account. And I do think that part of the dynamic, which we're seeing in this country, and specific to what you talked about, to why evangelical churches is the loss of power. Um, and uh, and that's not a good testimony to it, number one, because here I'm just overlaying my own theology on it. I would say Christianity is closer to anti-power than to power. I don't think the cross is a symbol of power. It's a symbol of a lot of other things, but it's not a symbol of, uh, of, of power. So I think that needs to be taken into account. And I also think that uh, power has the, the ability to corrupt people's judgments because you will do what you want to maintain power over other people. Um, but I would also say that power itself, people, people who have positions of power or people who don't have positions of power, uh, that doesn't necessarily validate whatever their views are. I don't think the powerless by definition necessarily have better ideas 
or, or what they're advocating may be right or it may be wrong. I think that experience has to be taken into account. I think if there's injustice, it has to be taken into account. But you can be in a position of less power and advocate things that could be harmful. And you can be people who have power and have exercised power in, in a responsible way. Um, and uh, in, in the case of what you talked about, um, even acknowledging what I've said, and I think what you're hinting at, which, which we're not hinting at, but really stated, which is that white evangelical churches don't want to, you know, people who are white evangelicals lose power, um, acknowledge that that's true. It's also important to acknowledge that there are a lot of very good and decent people who care about their country and they care about their children and they care about a lot of good things and they have concerns and some of those are legit concerns and they deserve a voice too um, and they need to be able to, to, to be heard and to have their arguments in their case um, judged in the same way that, 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 anybody, that anybody else, <clears throat> else does. Um, so it's, it's, it's a balancing act, but it's all part of this larger enterprise which we're talking about, which the Danforth Center is committed to, which is uh, faith and, and politics and the search, search for truth. Um, and none of us is getting it right, but I think all of us can get it more right than we've got right now. Thank you so much. We're about at the end of time. Any final words uh, from you, Sabrina? Um, just first of all, I really appreciate the fact that you're having a forum on this and that I, I do think the more attention that's sort of paid to the assault on truth and what we can do about it, the better. Uh, one of the, the challenges I think has been that for the, you know, the last several years, uh, people who often do speak up are, especially those who are, are in public life and, and may seem from the outside to have a lot of power, but you know, it can also be a very vulnerable and precarious position. Um, you know, often saying one thing or the other can get you doxxed, threatened, you know, your children threatened and the like, all of that has the, you know, the effect of driving uh, some of the, the saner, more um, epistemically uh, but modest, um, you know, kind of wise people from the public square and, and leaving uh, that whole arena to people who essentially kind of thrive off of the, you know, negative adulation and, it, you know, that their aggression will, will kind of spawn. And so, you know, I think it's really important, um, you know, to, to be there, to, to seek understanding, uh, to be willing to, to say things that uh, you, you know might receive pushback and to engage with that. And, and that is, I think, how, how we learn to grow, um, both as, as persons, but also as, as a people. Wonderful. That's a great place to end it. Thank you all for joining us in person and online. And yes, thank, thank our guests. Thank you. And please join us at our reception right outside uh, these doors. You don't have to buy a book to stay for the reception, uh, but you can greet our guests and each other. So thank you all.